think you should Welcome to the Bethanize Kiwi Collectors. Uh, we're trying a new format. Uh, it's probably going to be the permanent format for here on out. out. Uh, we've been covering, what was it again? Snowpiercer? Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer. Uh, so, uh, I suppose we'll give it a little bit of a rundown. It's a Chris Evans independent film adventure. Uh, it's basically the humanities on its last legs. We're all living on a train and... They're going from one end of the train to the other end of the train. And it's like a dystopian hero's journey, <laughs> basically. Yeah, that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty hit it on the head there. Um, it's global warming is really bad. So all the governments get together and pump a chemical into the atmosphere that works too well. And we end up in another ice age. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing, the only people that have survived are these people that live on an oven engineered train and the story follows Chris Evans' character, Curtis, as he's basically trying to stage a revolution within the train. Yeah. And I think, to me, the reason I really like this movie is because it doesn't just follow the standard hero's journey in the concept of, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, blah, go. Uh, it follows, in my opinion, uh, it covers classism, which is a big, big thing. Yeah. And it also uh, follows the concept of how something that takes control of your life as in a permanent part of your life can be deified because they refer to the train as like the divine train the, yeah, divine the engine, engine is divine the the character the the runs the train isn't just a man he becomes more than a man because they have to live on this train and without him they'll all die yeah and he gets away with so much more you know he, he becomes a god to them and that's and it's really shown by the his character uh, cast of just bizarre, almost bizarre, like creatures of, of this. Not even, right. not even like a, a um, Taylor Swin's character to me stands out because it's she's incredible. It's that whole concept of like how can someone become more than a man as being literally your life or death. Yeah, Tilda Swinton's character is probably the strongest in this. In this. I mean, though it's about Curtis and his struggle, I think Tilda really sort of gets the plot moving and is the cam the straw that broke the camel's back in oh, terms yeah. of the revolution. Yeah. Because uh, she's both sort of the catalyst and its downfall. Oh, big time. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was really interested by that. There are uh, certainly things that show that this was not a AAA budget film. Oh, yeah. But I don't think it's distracting um so some of the because because obviously earth isn't actually frozen over so they had to use uh computer graphics to render the post-apocalyptic earth and i think this film really wasn't designed for blu-ray no i think it was had dvd in mind yeah and i think if i had watched it on dvd those would have aged a lot more gracefully however i they don't detract from the story because the story isn't about spectacle it really really isn't definitely um, even though it's like really sort of a, it's a whimsical film and sort of like America McGee's Alice yeah, in Wonderland yeah. more than Lewis Carroll's. The interesting thing is because when you come to scenes where they're transitioning from one end of the train to the other, mm. when they're just moving, you've only got a couple of shots realistically because you can't do that big, like what, what made Lord of the Rings really, really nice, which yeah. was a big landscape. You, you can't do that in a train. You can't. Exactly. And that's, I think, exactly what you mean when you're talking about the scenery in the background being literally just the background, like yeah. you're walking past it. It doesn't matter. Um, I think. It's never a focus point. Yeah, exactly. The, um, I think the talking of that, I think the cinematography in this movie, other than the shaky cam, which is kind of like the, the bottom of the drawer now. Yeah. Because back, like, I remember watching uh, the Jason Bourne. The Bourne trilogy, yeah. And you watch it now, and it's absolutely terrible, because every action sequence, even though it's amazingly... The fighting... That's the, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, even though the choreography of the fighting is amazing in it, mm. it's ruined by the shaky cam. Yeah, I agree. I think this film really could have benefited from no shaky cam. However, I completely understand why, because they actually were filming in a confined space. Yeah. I think Shaky Spam a cam was more of a 
Shaky spam. <laughs> Shaky spam. Well, it was more because of the restrictions on the, the filming crew. Yeah. And I think it fits because especially the, uh, what is it called? The Yekaterra Bridge. The bridge fight. Yeah. yeah. That's the only time that I noticed it this watch through. Um, and I think that scene in itself without it would, I, I, there's no, there's no detraction with it mm. in there. Um, I think that scene in itself is quite powerful because it goes from extreme lights to dark, yeah, uh, which is hard to film, and especially when the sequence where you're looking through the perspective of someone the wearing FPS night view. vision, yeah, yeah, the, the, the FPS view um, is a lot more subtle, and it's not like a, a fanboy sort of circle jerk like it is in Doom, Doom for yeah. example. I think, uh, it was very tactless in Doom. It. For me, that scene had to be in first person. And I don't think this is the only film that's ever used uh, first person perspective for night vision. Yeah. I think, to be honest, it's kind of the only way to film it. In a way, if you look at um, the original Cloverfield, right? So they have a night vision scene in that that is first person. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense because they have to use the camera for the nighttime view. So I really don't think that detracts. And I think it adds more to the scene, especially when you see sort of... um, uh edgar's character yeah uh where he is blindly slashing yeah i, I love yeah. that because that that uncertainty in the dark is something that is very very human and there's a moment where two of the uh revolutionaries hit each other and yeah. then the guys just move in and waste them and i thought that was really quite cool and i do like that that call down the train for the fire and then they come yes. charging up again and the guy who had his arm frozen off was just like charging up there like yeah i'm gonna do it I think that scene, to me, in the bridge in the new year, is it stands out. Um, mm. I think going past that, uh, when you're going through the different train carriages as you're following the characters through, um, I do agree with you with the gunfight between the carriages across when they're doing a like a U-turn. Yeah, that makes as no sense. It, it makes no sense, and the concept of like, okay, I can understand you could open the like an airlock and then put the dude's arm out but then shooting permanent holes in the side of a train like that's not forward thinking no no of course not and that's why the other two guys that were with the i I don't even think their character was named no no i don't think so either um are freaking out when he's doing it and he's literally just like get the hell off me like i'm gonna go kill these people yes and and for me i think it's sort of in a way it kind of went against the (sighs) I suppose physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but also, like, I mean, he shoots a, a hole through the window, and if the outside is supposed to be, like, post-apocalyptically cold, which we find out later it's not, yeah. um, and I suppose in a way this is sort of foreshadowing-ish, but really cold wind should have been coming in, and everybody yeah. should have been suffering for yeah. it. Yeah, especially when they open the door to put his arm out. Um, I really enjoyed the transition of different... It was sort of a, sort of a over-the-shoulder following from a uh, close close proximity behind the characters as they're moving through the cabins i think moving between and seeing the classism gap uh between the different classes you know they start off in this really confined space where yeah. there's no light and then they move through and there's like an orchard and then the aquarium and the <laughs> which is actually my favorite shot in the whole movie yeah, is the aquarium you mentioned it, you're like i love aquariums and it's like that that whole sequence just transitioning through ignoring cutting out all these things that happen in between yeah the transition shots are really well done um the sort of really random rave den and then the drug den sequences because they're they're going through from being dark and gloomy and sterile when they're going through some of the staff quarters and then they end up in like a uh what is it like a hairdressing bar or a bar and it's all brightly lit. I feel like there's also, it's different periods of Earth's history. Each segment, because there's a segment that looks like the 50s. Yeah. There's a segment just before that that looks like the 1920s. And when they go into the den, it's got that, like, what the 80s thought the future would look like yeah. vibe to it. Like, very Blade Runner, I think, the 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 rave and drug den segment. It's interesting, too, because the colors in those rooms change. And I yeah. think it's also a mood change when you're following, because it starts off with, like, hope and guster and spirit and they end up in sort of a brighter lighter area and then it gets dimmer as they go yeah. towards the head of the train as their hope is diminishing and i think if that was intentional or are we just no no, no. I, I that's definitely intentional yeah and it's um 
because the film was directed by a South Korean um, director, that's definitely a South Korean cinema choice. Um, uh, so things like um, reminds me a lot of Old Boy actually. Yeah. Um. So Old Boy has the the he's stuck in the room dinge, and then he gets the hope. And the hope is diminished, and all color leaves the the yeah. film again. Yeah. So it's, it's 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 very much a South Korean cinema uh, cinematography choice, which is interesting because it counters what Westerners do, which they pick a color and then mm. just stick with it. Like how The Matrix Reloaded was the greeniest movie of all time. <laughs> yes, it is. And um, I found the colors in uh, Justice League really bizarre as well. Oh, uh, dude! When they go to Red City, yeah, it's that, awful. Yeah um following the actual characters themselves curtis i think is uh you know he's now uh, chris evans is now you know really well paid and obviously not as well as robert downey jr in yeah. the uh, marvel cinematic universe but seeing him at a gritty a gritty er and not a stark span yeah, banner right? <laughs> character um the end speech he gives well it's not even the end it's one of the you know right before the transition it's the third the act basically third act speech at the beginning of the um or mid i'd say mid third act speech yeah where um that that you you said oh, it's weird seeing captain america smoking yeah that was so peculiar to me <laughs> that sequence when he goes like uh, i am the worst thing i that i hate about myself is the fact that i know what people taste like and yeah. you're just like oh so smoking got you that's what got me yeah. like <laughs> i know what people taste like no one wants to say that like yeah. The whole fact that these people were so poor, they literally had to eat each other to survive. Which is something that's happened throughout human history. If you look yeah. at, like, uh, post-revolutionary Russia, man, yeah. like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I thoroughly enjoy this movie. I've shown it to a few people who have had the same reaction you did, which is like, how come I'd never heard of this? And it's like, well, it's simple. It's yeah. not. It's one of my sister, uh, Cece, who joins us in our stream sometimes. It's actually one of her favorite films. Yeah. I, when I first saw it, I was just like, why has nobody seen this? Why yeah. is no one talking about this? And it's just mainly because we're not, I wouldn't say the the greatest absorbers of uh, culture in our, in our country. We just tend to, tend to go to the AAA. We don't get a lot of indie releases in our country. Yeah, and we, only, we only get them during film festivals, yeah. which is frustrating. Yeah. And I've been to a few film festivals where movies have stood out to me being like, this is amazing. Why yeah. the hell wouldn't people see this versus, you know, blah 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 i saw a danish film uh during a film festival called the royal affair and i honestly think it's the greatest dramatic film ever made (laughs) and it's it's so good and no one saw it yeah um it's actually um it's what put mads mickelson on the map actually was this film this film it's fantastic i thoroughly thoroughly recommend it i'll have to look that up at a later point in time yeah and like Mads Mikkelsen, if you're listening, uh, this hashtag you can marry me, you know, whenever you want, propose to me, uh, you know, hashtag you're my boy. Um, for me, there are some things that have, that I have issues with in this film. And I think that again comes back to the the difference in cinema between the West and the East. Uh, something I notice a lot, a lot, and I think it's it's a part of my brain I need to be able to turn off. Yeah, is I'm not watching you know Western film, and I, I notice this a lot because I watch Chinese television with my wife. They break the 180 rule in Chinese TV oh, all the time, all the time. Yeah, and don't break that, but yeah. for them they just don't care. Yeah, and for me there was uh, a character issue early in the film where they need a violinist. Yeah, and it really frustrated me from. Uh, a directing point of view as well as a, a writing point of view is they they two they, there's this old couple right and the gentleman of the couple looks to be very much senior to the woman of the couple and they're both violinists and he's like hey can we both go and like they just want one of you and then he breaks the the guard breaks the woman's hands and that doesn't make any sense to me because if the older gentleman passes away which it kind of looks like he's going to get to his expiry date a lot sooner than his wife and then the only other violinist now can't play the violin. That that didn't make any sense to me whatsoever, and actually took me out of the movie for a bit. The interesting part is I don't know if you noticed, but the violin that he played only had one string. Yeah. So that's how bad, like how much they're losing. Um, that sequence when they're in the school, because it's a school sequence yeah. when the violinist turns up. I think that's probably the most powerful. Other than I love end, that scene. Other than the end speech with Chris Evans, you know, Curtis's character, the character Curtis, sorry. Um, 
because it shows how I wouldn't even say mind warped. It's just it shows how something so powerful can become deified. Yeah. And with all the weird hand movements they were doing, where they were doing like a like an arrow salute, from, you know, like a, a, yeah. a side suit because they were all freeze and die. We're like, all freeze and die. That scene for me was like the merging of nazism yeah, it was very and fascist. 1950s america yeah like it, it, it was very interesting to see sort of the what if there yeah, yeah. um i do like the teacher character because it stands out as being unique and the scene that always gets me is when she's singing on the organ and spinning around <laughs> and when it when she's singing and she closes her eyes and looks and up, then rolls her eyes back yeah yeah because it's it's she believes it 100%. Yeah. They all do. That's that's yeah. the scary part. That is it. their religion. Yeah. Because uh, you go through, if they've been on the train for 17 years, and it talks about uh, Yono's character being a train baby. Yeah. And then you go through. So these kids that are being taught are like five, six. Mm. Uh, the girl that always stands up and says that, you know. Train the bigot. Is, the bigot. Yeah. Um, she's obviously a lot older. It's interesting showing that the progression of the human race is still doing their thing. And then when you get to the like the rave den, yeah, and they're in their twenties to thirties, and it's like these kids would have been carried on as babies by these rich people with that had the A class tickets, yeah, because that was the thing about the classes, and they were, you know, they bought tickets, and depending on where you bought a ticket, where you stood, and it, I think the only issue with that is the rave parties at the end of the train where it should have been mid, but that that's just me focusing on train. I, I think though so. it makes sense. Layout. It makes sense because the children who are being taught this very intense and strict sort of religious life are sort of given an area to go through the rebellion stage yeah. of their development and then finally into the conform because the thing that i thought about it was it's literally dividing classes so you've got the poverty people the mm. lowest class then you've got the police that protect the middle class from the poor yeah and then the the upper class are proper and you know they're, they're just trying to do their thing and do their thing and then you've got the top 10 percent who just want to party and get wasted yeah and then you've got a person controlling them all because what, what else are you going to do you're literally if you go outside you're dead yeah. that, that's it there's no there's no it's that whole concept of why humans don't leave is because space programs are expensive <laughs> <laughs> oh no one no one who's got money wants to pay for it yeah, which is funny because now people who have money want to pay, to pay for, for it. it. Yeah. Um, uh, tch, 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 I just had a thought and it's left me. That's really annoying. I'll I keep talking until you think about it. Um, I think that's that goes back to the classism of the middle class being super religious is also another point. Yeah. Um, which think- is funny because in real life, the middle class tend to be super religious. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, how a seven-ish-year-old girl can have bigoted opinions about a, basically a class of people she's never met and probably yeah. would never meet without the revolution. Um, the end end of the movie, to me, stands out, uh, unless you want to, maybe your thought come back to you. You're giving me a look. Yeah, no, no. So, yeah, my thought here was um, in New Zealand, they actually wanted to do a class divide in Auckland um the the funny the funnily enough she was south korean she was the one who part who got the file sharing law passed yeah and she wanted to actually divide the classes in auckland blocking off the poorer areas from having access to the richer areas via the highway that's really bizarre yeah. because <laughs> i think as as a european descendant kiwi i see us as one people yeah and the issue is is that people who uh are not or and the same want to be like no we have to be divided no we have to be together no we have to be divided yeah we have to be together but certain people get more rights than others it's like no 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 we're in the 21st century bro everybody has to work together yeah so yeah and so like when i was watching this film and i was just like is this actually something south korea is afraid of because the deification of the leader of the train and how everybody sees him as the divine, even though he's just a man, reminds me of North Korea. Yeah. North Korea actually deify their leader. Yeah. So it's interesting seeing like the political point of view of the director coming through in the script in a way that I don't think was haphazard. I don't think it was too on the nose, to be honest. Yeah. Um, 
you have you moving on to the the end of the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the Wilford's the portrayal of Wilford. Uh, the actor's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I saw him, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I was just like, like, oh it my has god, to be it him. has to be him. <laughs> um, the concept that even he's suffering, which uh, uh, there is stress at the leadership mm. at the top. Um, I don't think it was as strong as having to eat children to yeah. survive. <laughs> yeah. Um, when he was sitting there eating steak and being like, when was the last time you got laid? Yeah. Um, the reveal that. Uh, Gillian, who, the you know the leader that uh, Curtis has been following, because he was one of the people that stood up and literally started sacrificing his limbs to the yeah. cannibalistic horde. Um, him finding out that they talked to each other, the fact that Wilford's the one sending the notes, um, the fact that he's there, Curtis has been let there to now take over and run the train. Exactly. And I did like the sequence where it talks about after the Battle of the Bridge and uh, they're counting, you know, they're counting the dead. Yeah. And he says, you know, it's 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 easy to being have two arms. And that sequence where I think in my mind, Curtis redeems himself in his own mind. He doesn't need redemption. Yeah. He's not redeeming himself for any horrible thing that he did other than cannibalism and children. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Where he sacrifices his own arm, yeah, to save Timmy. to save a child, yeah, the child he promised he'd save, as yeah, well. yeah, exactly. Um, and then you get to the the end, which uh, I both I, I completely agree with you on that sequence where uh, I think the explosion was a little bit too OP. Um, I I think though, um, yeah, I'm I agree with you. Yeah, it was right. Yeah, it should not have been that massive. Like if they just derailed the train. And it had been and like you know the Curtis and uh, I can't uh, what was his, what's the character Num. name? N- Nam's dead. I'm happy with that. Yeah, but yeah, like you said, after five generations of people inbreeding, that's that's it. Yeah, um, humanity is extinct, and I think the film doesn't like give you this idea of hope. Yeah, because like humanity would be extinct. Not to mention the polar bear. Yeah, because polar bears can smell blood from like ages away, yeah. and they all they do is eat. Yeah. for the entire season up until they have to <laughs> sleep, sleep eat, so. mate and sleep and polar bears actively hunt humans yeah so this is that sequ- <laughs> like the sequence after the credits would just be the polar bear streaming down the hill yeah wiping yeah. up the last of mankind yeah and I think you were supposed to leave on that that it's over yeah. like with everybody dying on the train because no no one survived that no. I'm surprised actually Yun survived yeah. it and Timmy um, but they were sandwiched between basically cushions yeah so that makes sense i think there was a great sacrifice for curtis is because he's like it's over yeah i'm gonna help you out kid um but yeah so with just yun and timmy being left if they did procreate it would only last five generations so mankind has died so it's interesting because they're talking about a i don't know if it's a mini series or a tv show based on the movie oh really um that's in the works i don't know if it's actually got a release date or actually anything's done i don't think this leads itself to a television format yeah um i I don't know if they're gonna do a lost thing with it maybe it'll start after the end of the train and more people have survived oh we'll get a tail section that won't make any sense though yeah i know i know but who knows is america making it Probably. that answers that question yeah. everyone <laughs> survived the massive derailment of the super train yeah <laughs> even though what it took like they were literally in that sequence uh before the bridge they oh no it was during the bridge sequence yeah they're literally driving through like solid ice and it's like almost derailing the train that train got hit by a full-up avalanche yeah like, they did yeah yeah and half of it went down a cliff yeah and i think it was they, over half actually yeah because only the first four cat uh, four things made five, it to the yeah. tunnel. So I think it was supposed to have a bleak ending. It wasn't ambiguous. No. Um, and I think some people might come away from the film thinking it's ambiguous, but it really is the director showing us that it, it failed. Yeah. <laughs> Curtis redeems himself, but it failed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd have to say I recommend this film. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard some negative things about it but i completely disagree i think it's a fantastic piece of cinema but i think that goes back to what we we're talking about just before where new zealanders don't understand cinema outside of western cinema yeah which is annoying it's it, i think it's just more what we're fed is what we enjoy yeah not everyone likes you know things out of the ordinary like we were talking about in lunch talking about chicken livers and chicken hearts yeah yeah exactly 
Um, it's like people who tell me that like they don't watch anime because cartoons are for kids, and I'm just like, you literally have no idea what yeah, you're talking watch, about. Watch, watch Berserk. Watch yeah, Berserk not only that though. Kids. Like if you look at Heavy Metal, which is a cartoon, that's yeah. not for kids. No, no. Watership Down isn't for kids as oh, far no. as I'm concerned. Yeah. Like there, there's a lot of animation that's like that animation is a storytelling medium and for some reason people have it in their heads that it's just for little kids yeah like you pop on yeah like you're saying pop on berserk for your children yeah. you're probably going to be in a lot of trouble yeah definitely because <laughs> there was a uh, that that moment where there was one retailer i won't mention because they don't exist anymore um were selling anime and it was one of the only ones selling anime and yeah. i remember you being like bro you should take this off your show yeah yeah, I remember like, that. They why? Had... It's like, because this is not anime. This yeah. is the opposite of anime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. It's like, no, yeah. who the hell bought this? Like, it was That was pretty bad. And they hadn't age restricted it or anything. Yeah. And I was like, oh, because it's cartoons. So I'm like, no. no. And, and and I definitely think that's where sort of the negative ideas of this film come from. From the Kiwis that I've talked to about it, they didn't like it. It's because they just don't know anything outside of Hollywood. Yeah. And that's sad because Hollywood doesn't even make the best movies. No, definitely not. They make awful remakes of the best movies. Yeah. Like the fact that the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo remake didn't get a sequel, yeah. <laughs> even though it was going to be a trilogy. Because the original's superior in every facet. It's in- interesting seeing uh, the characters uh, from this move on to bigger and better things. Mm. Um, I remember seeing Chris Evans first off in that horrible, horrible, do not speak about it uh, movie about four people that apparently <laughs> are fantastic or something. <laughs> um, and then my favorite portrayal character that he's ever played was uh, Lucas Lee and scott pilgrim and scott pilgrim versus the world yeah and, and that's when he was still just becoming big yeah and then seeing him doing this movie it shows that he especially in the, the last i'm gonna just like fucking go hard on that last sequence where he has that speech uh it is fantastic he, yeah way. he can act he can act he can't just stand there on the oh, bottom yeah, dude. The, behind if, a green screen if and you watched like, like winter soldier he can act yeah, man yeah but it's just the, the more of the focus of like, oh, I don't like Captain America because his character's dumb. It's like, yeah, his character is dumb. That's the whole point. Yeah. But the thing is, is like people coming at it from that, again, that goes back to what I'm talking about. You don't understand yeah. the medium. Yeah. The whole point is he was a glorified American patriot figure because it was World War II. Yeah. Right. It's like when people tell me that Superman's a bad character, pick up a book yeah. and then shut the fuck up. Yeah. Because he is not a bad character. It's because Zack Snyder has made him not a good character. Yeah, but it wasn't just... And Zach. Christopher Lee, unfortunately, yeah. like, rest in peace, but yeah. his portrayal isn't Superman either. Um, I think the worst out of all of them, if we're going to... Brandon we're gonna, Roth? Is, is Superman Returns. Yeah, Brandon Roth. And he redeemed himself in Scott Pilgrim as well, actually. Yeah, yeah, he was fantastic <laughs> in Scott Pilgrim, but yeah, just that entire movie should just die in a hole. Yeah. Especially yeah. since it was retconning uh, the two bad Christopher Lee ones. It, let, let's just put it this way. Uh, there should be a conversation between uh, Superman and Lois Lane about uh, the time that she doesn't remember them having sex. and uh, Yeah, and having a kid. That was weird. Yeah. Especially it was meant to fit into the Christopher Lee continuity. Yeah. Uh, Christopher Reeves, sorry. Yeah. Christopher Reeves uh, continuity. That was a bit weird. Um, but yeah, all in all, I think this was a fantastically directed film. It was perfect. Tilda Swinton's my favorite. Yeah. I loved her to pieces. Every yeah. millisecond she was in frame, I loved it. That's uh, that the the powerfulness of her portrayal, standing there in her woolen coat and looking down at them. Uh, you know, the be a show. Yeah, yeah, the be a show. That speech is incredible. And she's making it up as she goes as well. And the sequence where she's watching them getting slaughtered. Mm. And she's just like super, like, I oh, don't want to use this term, but she's literally excited about yeah, watching yeah. people getting massacred. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then that sequence where she takes her teeth out and yeah. is all like, mm, doing the top look quiver at him. It's yeah. just like, that's messed up, man. It's such a flip in a character, but that's, the portrayal is amazing of it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that she's a weasel. Yeah. She's a oh, weasel. 100%. Yeah. And I, I, I love it. Yeah. T- Tilda Swinton is possibly my favorite actress working in the industry at the moment hashtag i still love you judy dench but um <laughs> but so i think she really is a chameleon when it comes to roles have you seen hail caesar no it was a very very underrated film but i think it was my favorite comedy of that year and she's in it as her own twin and it's ambiguous whether or not she actually has the twin oh, okay it's and it's one of my favorite portrayals from her but tilda swinton is, is such a powerful powerful actress um, 
I personally don't like putting a a number on a review. Yeah, I think, yeah. Well, we're actually talking about that discussion this week. Actually. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of blowback from the community uh, in regards to you know this gets a four point five and this gets a ten and this is get mm. you know it, it, when you have reviewers doing reviews and they say you know blah 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 this is bad this is bad this is bad you know 7 and 0.5 out of 10 you're like you just pan the movie oh, this, yeah that shouldn't this be a two or oh, the, the the that's another classic of like uh, you'll get uh, a game there's two 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 major competitors in multiplayer first person shooters and yeah. consoles and you'll have one get panned for having the same thing as the last edition and the other one get praised for having the same, the same thing, thing as, as the last, last edition. Yeah. And it, just, it shows you that money talks. Yeah. And, you know, no one's paying us for this review. You're paying us with your time, which we appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, I don't like putting a numbers on it, but I would say I would, if I was going to make a, a, a random a num- a random review uh, critic off the top of my head that's not based on a number or a letter, I'd say aggressively recommend to friends. Yeah, actually, I'm with you on that. I quite like reviewers that actually use um, adjectives and superlatives yeah. instead yeah. of numbers. And yeah, I I, th- I would thoroughly recommend this film. Film, yeah. I think it's incredible. Uh, Rel with your time, yeah, definitely. Alrighty, well, uh, thank you all for your time. Thank and you I hope for you being enjoyed here. Enjoyed a new format that's less time consuming, and you don't have to sit there and watch the movie and have us talk over it the entire <laughs> time. I, I kind of had had a good time with the uh, the Dune commentary. Oh yes, um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll catch you later.